Dr. Andrew Wiles, Integrative Medicine, Part 2. We're now going to move into this portion of the program on specific areas of integrative medicine. And the thing to remember here, if you will, is this larger framework, that these are pieces of a whole. So there aren't the answers within each one of them, but rather how do we integrate these in our own lives and how do we integrate these for patients? We have very talented fellows, as Dr. Wild has referenced to you. We had a very competitive selection process every year. This is the only fellowship of its kind. And we chose these four from about a pool of 100 very qualified applicants. And they've each given up a tremendous amount to be with us for two years. They have all were in well-established, successful careers, uprooted their families in many cases to move to Tucson to earn a fellow's salary, which is basically a resident's salary. So there are many sacrifices at many levels, and one of the joys of working in this program is being with people whose passion is their work, and that's a real blessing. So Victoria Mazes is going to lead off today and talk to you about the relationship of mind and body on both ends of the spectrum. And just to give you a little bit of her professional training, Dr. Mays has received her medical degree from the University of California in San Francisco, and then went on to do a practice residency at the University of Missouri in Columbia, after which she joined Kaiser Permanente in Santa Rosa, California. She had many leadership roles while she was at Kaiser Permanente, and I'd take too much time to list them all. But one of them that I think is most interesting was that from 1994 to 1996, Dr. Mazes led a wellness design team and an outpatient implementation team in Kaiser's primary care re-engineering effort. So it was very involved in facilitating change in that system. To us, we have the joy of having Victoria and her husband and her three children with us in Tucson. A rumor had it that her husband did 90% of the cooking, and I asked her that at one of the breaks last time because I thought, is that really true? And she thought for a second and she said, well, 90% of the good cooking. <laughs> so with that personal vignette, I would ask you to welcome Dr. Victoria Mazes. Thanks, Tracy. My husband actually owned a restaurant for a while, and he is a wonderful cook. <laughs> I have the great privilege of talking to you today about the mind-body continuum. And I really do consider it a privilege because one of my great passions and loves, the reason that medicine is fun for me, is I love hearing people's stories. And um, I find it fascinating to try and understand the significance of the stories in their lives and how illness can serve as a metaphor for people. And for me, this became a very natural transition to look at mind-body medicine. And so it's an area of deep interest for me, and I'm happy to have the chance to present on it. I'm a family doctor by training, as you heard, and I, therefore, like to look at the big picture of things and synthesis. And what I'm going to do for you today is try and give you the big picture for mind-body medicine. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, I'm going to try and help you understand where this concept came from. And then next, what I'd like to do is review with you some of the evidence for mind-body medicine. From there, I'm going to try and help you understand how we go about selecting the modalities that we use. And finally, I'm going to try and share with you where mind-body, body-mind fits into integrative medicine. So that's my goal for the next 30 minutes. What I'd like you to do for a moment, if you're willing, is to have a short experience. And um, you might even want to close your eyes for this. It's up to you. And then what I'd like you to do is to imagine a lemon. Everyone knows that a lemon is yellow and it's kind of oval in shape, maybe tapers off at the ends. And now go ahead and take that lemon and in your mind's eye, bring it up to your nose and inhale deeply the fragrance of that lemon, that unique fragrance that only a lemon has. Good. Okay. Now, once again, in your mind's eye, put the lemon on a cutting board and slice through it with a sharp knife. And as you do so, maybe a few drips of the juice fall on your finger 
And go ahead and take your finger and raise it up to your lips and taste that juice. Great. Okay, maybe even touch the lemon again and bring a few more drips up to your mouth. Perfect. Okay, and you can open your eyes. How many people in this room experience the greater salvation in doing that exercise? Yeah. Okay. So we have this experience with the lemon. So we know, I mean, it's very obvious that there's this powerful connection, and yet how separate we see the mind and the body. So where did this come from? And the answer is, it probably started with René Descartes, who was a 17th century French philosopher. And he actually was a mathematician as well. And he became pretty despondent. He was trying to figure out, what is it that I'm sure that I know? And do I even know that 2 plus 2 is 4? And what he did is he said, I'm going to take a few steps backwards, and I'm going to think about what is it that I can be absolutely certain of, that I just could not doubt. And the first thing he came up with is, I think, therefore I am. So he couldn't doubt that he was thinking, that he had a mind, and actually for him the mind and the soul were very closely linked. He was a deeply religious man. And that was his first basis of philosophy. And then he also said, I cannot doubt that I have a physical body. And for him, the physical body and the rest of the material world was what he called, you know, the extension. And so he said, I extend, therefore I am. From this two separate philosophies of being, the reductionists came, and basically they wanted to know, well, what's measurable? What can we be objective about? And what they said was, well, we could measure the physical being, and they sort of forgot about the rest. And this has led us to incredible successes, actually. I mean, we have, as a result of reductionism, as a result of separating things into component parts, we have had great success. We have germ theory and cell theory and atomic theory and gene theory. And Time after time, we've had great success by using these methods, and so much success that it's become a very deep part of the way we look at things in our culture. And so if you think about something as basic as the wart, right? Well, reductionism tells us a lot about the wart. It tells us that it's a virus. It tells us about its protein sheath. It tells us about all the different varieties that you might see and how they manifest on the skin. But reductionism doesn't tell us the whole story. It still doesn't tell us why it is to begin with that the ward infects. And it also doesn't tell us why one of the most successful ways of treating warts might be a mind-body technique, hypnosis. Well, in Chinese medicine, the mind-body split doesn't exist. So our culture took this path, but there are other cultures that have never gone along this path of creating a separation between mind and body. And Chinese medicine has this beautiful symbol that Ofer's going to talk about more later that exemplifies this. So we have yin and yang contained in the same circle, and then they taper one into the other, and we have a little bit of yang and the yin, and a little yin and the yang, and it's a beautiful visual symbol that shows the interconnectedness. On the other hand, we have nothing like that in Western medicine. I mean, not only do we not have a visual symbol, we don't even have words to express the interconnectedness. Now, we actually do have a whole new field. It's called psychoneuroimmunology. And psychoneuroimmunology is a new field that basically looks at how the mind does impact health and healing. And that has made some major changes. There's a lot of research in this field. Just as one example, they do things like have children imagine increasing their immune substances using hypnosis. 
And then variable and measure changes in the salivary IgA levels. So that's wonderful. So that's a little bit about the concept. What is the evidence? This is a quote by Paracelsus, who has been called the father of medicine. And what he says is, the spirit is the master, imagination the tool, and the body the plastic material. The power of the imagination is a great factor in medicine. It may produce diseases in man, and it may cure them. So Paracelsus called the power of imagination, and today we would call that the placebo effect. So another way to talk about the placebo effect is the power of belief, or perhaps the body's innate healing system, right? And one of the ways to show how important this power is, is that today, the gold standard for doing studies is the randomized control trial. And in those trials, what the control means is that it is a group who has the exact same circumstances or as close as possible to the experimental group. So as an example, they try and give the control group a matching pill to the drug that the other group gets, or they do sham acupuncture while the other group gets real acupuncture. And the reason they go to so much trouble is that it has been shown that 30% of more people will respond just based on the power of their belief that they are going to get better. And so what we do is we sort of subtract that when we look at the actual effectiveness of a drug or whatever. I want to give you an example of this power of belief. There was a study done in Japan a long time ago in which they took 13 students who were highly allergic to poison ivy. And what they did is they told the students they were going to expose them to poison ivy. And they took the poison ivy, right, except actually it was a harmless leaf. So they took a harmless leaf and they rubbed it on one arm of the student. Well, when they rubbed that harmless leaf, but said it was poison ivy, all 13 of the students reacted and broke out in a rash. Then they took actual poison ivy and rubbed it on the other arm, but they said that they were using a harmless leaf. Only two of the students of the 13 reacted when they believed that it was a harmless leaf. So, pretty impressive. I want to give you some specific examples from the research evidence. And I only have a short amount of time. And you need to know that there are books written on this subject. I mean, there's 30 years of evidence about the effect of mind, body, and a little less about body, mind. And so I'm just going to give you some of what I think are important examples. And I want to give you a couple showing how the mind has been used to treat conditions that you think of usually as being in the body, specifically breast cancer and infertility. And then what I want to do is give you a couple of examples of how the body has been used to treat the mind and then a combination. So the first study I'd like to share with you is one that you may be familiar with already. It's a very important study and it was done by David Spiegel about 10 years ago with women with breast cancer. He took 86 women with metastatic breast cancer. And of the 86 women, he had 50 women be in the experimental group and 36 women were in the control group. What happened is, is that all these women continued to get their regular oncological care. But the 50 women in the experimental group also attended a weekly support group for a year. And in that support group, they were able to express their feelings about living with a life-threatening illness and any existential concerns they were dealing with. And they also were taught self-hypnosis to deal with pain. Now, David Spiegel, who is a psychiatrist at Stanford, wanted to show that this was going to improve the quality of their lives. He believed that, but he kind of also wanted to set to rest the idea that this would have any effect whatsoever on the quantity, on how long these women lived. Well, when they looked 10 years 
after the study began at this group of women, what did they find? They found that on average, the women who had been in the experimental group, that group support experience, lived almost twice as long, 36 months compared to 19 months for the control group. And one of the things that Dr. Spiegel speculated was important is that they really learned and had a chance to deal with the why me question that of course comes up and to deal with that feeling of powerlessness. The next piece of evidence I want to share with you is some work that Alice Domer has done. And Alice Domer is a researcher at Harvard and she has done some extensive work with women with infertility. And she developed a 10-week program, a mind-body program for women with infertility. She's seen, since 1987, 284 women go through her program. Now, on average, these women had had three years of high-tech infertility treatment. And what she discovered by having women go through a program, and they did a variety of things. It's a group, so group support and they learned how to express their feelings, and they learned relaxation therapies, and couples communication, and self-nurturance, all those things over the course of these 10 weeks. Well, 42% of the women became pregnant within six months. Now, Alice Domer actually doesn't tell women that mind-body is going to cure infertility, and she doesn't do that for a couple of reasons. One, she actually thinks the evidence isn't sufficient to make that claim. And right now, she has a five-year National Institute of Mental Health grant to actually look at that question. But she doesn't do it for another reason. And that's because the intent is to help people get out of the infertility trap in which you know, their whole life is bound up with trying to get pregnant and remind them of the rest of life, of the joy and meaning, the rest of life. So the next area of evidence is exercise and depression. And actually, there have been over a thousand studies done on using exercise to treat depression. And they have done all kinds of studies. They have done things where they do running versus cognitive therapy. And what do they discover? That both work, both work equally well. No difference between the two groups. They have compared doing aerobics and cognitive therapy and a control group. And what do they find? The aerobics group gets better, the cognitive therapy group gets better, and the control group doesn't do very well. So both groups show improvement and no difference, again, between the therapy and the exercise. And finally, they've looked at running versus weightlifting versus a combination of those. And once again, running and weightlifting did equally well. So we've learned that exercise works to treat depression. And we've also learned that it doesn't necessarily have to be aerobic exercise because weightlifting works equally well. What we don't have yet are studies looking at um, antidepressants versus exercise for treating depression. And that study is happening right now. Duke has a five-year study in which they're looking at Zoloft, which is one of the new SSRI antidepressants versus running versus a combination of Zoloft plus running, and that should probably be published in the next year or so, and it'll be very interesting to see what that shows. One of the leaders of this whole mind-body field is John Kabat-Zinn, who developed a stress reduction and relaxation program, and he has an eight-week program in which he has participants do three things. They do body scan, and Bill did a form of that this morning in meditation. And they do sitting, hatha yoga, and they do meditation. So those three things, they make a commitment to do it six days a week, 45 minutes a day, for the eight weeks of the program. And he's had all kinds of people come in and be participants in this program. So he's had people with chronic pain and with cancer and with hypertension and with heart disease, and he's seen wonderful results. The study I want to talk to you about is one in which he had 22 patients with anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder or panic attacks according to the criteria of the DSM-3. 
And with these 22 patients going through the program, he found both subjective and objective, he had all these different scales that he used, improvement in anxiety. So no huge surprise based on what I've told you so far. But what is very interesting is that he went back three years later and looked at those same group of 22 patients, and he found that they continued to show improvement to the same degree on all the scales. So that's very impressive that it lasted that long. And John Kabat-Zinn also is really interested in not so much teaching people how to deal with anxiety, but rather on how to explore people's own inner resources for growth and for healing. Okay, so now we've done a little bit on the concept and on some of the evidence. And now I'd like to move forward and talk a little bit about how we go about selecting the mind-body practices. And remember, mind-body means either thoughts or emotions, using either of those to impact the healing of the body. And already today you've had several of these experiences. We've done a little meditation and body scan, and I'm going to teach you a breathing exercise. And many of these may be familiar to you from other places as well. But when we think about choosing practices, you have to understand that we don't have the same body of research that we would have for the efficacy. So just as an example, many of the people I just gave as examples, they use combinations of things. I mean, John Kabat-Zinn has yoga and meditation and body scan. And that's very typical in terms of the way many of these things have been looked at. And we don't really have all of the research we'd want in terms of saying, well, of course, someone had a stroke, so you'd want to do Feldenkrais, or being able to point to things in quite that way. How then do we go about choosing? Well, although we don't have the evidence, we do have the opinions of many people who have worked with these for a long time. So we have Dr. Weil, and we have David Sobel, and we have Alice Domer, and we have Jim Gordon, and many people who have spent their lives and who give us some ideas. And what I've done is looked at their ideas and tried to synthesize how we make decisions for patients in the integrative medicine clinic. And I also want to share with you that we are doing research on this about our decision-making process. And we're looking at how much we weigh the literature versus expert opinion versus the patient's preference, et cetera. So some of the ways that I've sort of broken it down would be these four categories. First of all, the individual. You know, who is the individual? If they're a type A, you know, and they're going, going, going all the time, asking that person to do, you know, sitting meditation often doesn't work. They get this look of absolute anguish on their face when you ask them to do that. On the other hand, if you say, how about yoga or tai chi, well, that often works just great. Similarly, if you have them do progressive muscle relaxation. That gives them a structure and it coaxes them into an awareness of their body and they're occupied so their mind gets off of the to-do list. The next one would be experience. My experience and also of course the patient who's with me experience. Often patients come in with very strong ideas of what they think might be the best route for them to take. But how about my experience? Well, the more that I as a physician know about these different things, the better I am able to make appropriate referrals and to even make referrals that people can understand what it is that's motivating me to send them in a particular direction. And I think that that becomes very important. The disease. So what is it in the literature? I mean, what does the literature say about a particular disease? If you look at, for example, depression, well, once again, asking a depressed person to sit quietly may not be the best thing. Asking them to do guided imagery, sometimes it's just too dark. The images that come up are really not the ones that might be most positive. So Jim Gordon has this technique, he calls it shaking, and you put on loud music and you literally shake. It's exhausting. I don't know if any of you ever try that. I sometimes ask people to put on you know, their favorite loud rock and roll and dance in their living rooms, and they find that extremely liberating. And the practitioner. Well, we've all had this experience. I mean, all of us work with people who are particularly gifted in one area or another, and 
just as an example, we work with a psychologist in Tucson who has been practicing hypnosis for 25 years, and he is extremely gifted. He usually sees people one time and makes them a tape that they could use during that visit. And I had a patient with Crohn's disease who was waking up five times a night to go to the bathroom, and after she had one visit with him and used the tape in the evenings before going to bed, she was waking up twice a night. Well, that was more powerful than any medication she'd received in the 10 years she's had Crohn's disease. And finally, most of us are doing this somewhat on an intuitive level. You know, we're thinking about all these things and not necessarily separating out one from the other. And, you know, that's, of course, what the art of medicine is all about. So this is another quote that I really love. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. One of the things that I love about practicing integrative medicine is that all of a sudden there are so many options. There are so many choices. And being able to share those and discuss those with my patients is very powerful. And I would just make a suggestion to think about, well, what is it that you would want to incorporate into your own life? What might be an appropriate practice that would work for you in terms of, as Bob mentioned earlier, a way to have a regular relaxation practice? So now we've talked about where the concept came from, some of the evidence, some of how we go about choosing, and finally I want to talk about where it fits into integrative medicine. This is what Albert Schweitzer said. Each patient carries his own doctor inside of him. We are at our best when we give the doctor who resides within each patient a chance to go to work. So from my perspective, my body and body-mind, the whole continuum allows us to access our own internal healing ability. It's a wonderful way of getting to that possibility of healing oneself and working along that axis. And so many of the things are things that a person can do for themselves. They don't require necessarily a provider or a practitioner to do them for you. You can do your own breathing work and self-hypnosis and tai chi and yoga and exercise. So many of these things are things we can do on our own to access our own self-healing. And as I said, we often in our clinic teach a relaxation practice to everybody we see if they don't already have one. And I'd actually like to take a minute or so and teach one to you, if you're all willing. And it's a breathing exercise. What I'll do is I'll show it to you the way I show it to the patients I see in the clinic, which is first I actually describe it, and then I will demonstrate it, and then I will have all of you do it. It is based on yoga, so pranayama. It's ancient. It's not something that is brand new that we created. And it involves counting your breath. And what you will do is you'll inhale to the count of four through your nose. You'll hold your breath to the count of seven. And then you'll exhale to the count of eight. And you do that four times. Now, like everything, there's always a trick, right? So the trick in this is that the entire time you're doing it, your tongue is going to rest on the roof of your mouth. And there's a little spot, a ridge, right behind your upper teeth. And that's where I'd like your tongue to rest the entire time. And you start with exhalation, and then I'll talk you through it. But let me show it to you first, okay? You can close your eyes as you do this as well. Okay, so start off by exhaling. Good, now in through your nose, two, three, four. Hold your breath, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, out through your mouth, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Great. In through your nose, two, three, four. Hold your breath, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out through your mouth, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In through your nose, two, three, four. Hold your breath, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out through your mouth, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Last time, in through your nose, two, three, four, hold your breath, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out through your mouth, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight. Excellent. How do you feel? Yeah, I always find I shift to a slightly different place after I do this. And I recommend that you do it twice a day, morning and evening. I do it before I go to sleep. I go right to sleep. It's great, especially in hotels. <laughs> and anytime you're feeling stressed, you can also do this. It is really a wonderful way of diffusing some of the stress and tension in your body. So I started off today telling you that the reason that I'm so interested in this mind-body continuum is that I love hearing patient stories. And I want to end with another story, this time a popular story. And I think the reason that stories are so powerful when they are is that they contain some element of truth, something that makes them memorable. And this story you're all familiar with, the story of the Wizard of Oz. And what the wizard did that was so impressive is he helped the cowardly lion see that he already had courage. He helped the tin man see that he already had a heart and the scarecrow that he already had wisdom. He basically helped them see their own inner resources or, as Albert Schweitzer said, we are at our best when we give the doctor who resides within each patient a chance to go to work. So he helped them become aware of what was there all the time. And I believe that this is the incredible power that the mind-body and body-mind connection can have in integrative medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. I'm going to comment briefly on each of the fellows' presentations. The range of therapies based on mind-body interactions are very little utilized today in conventional medicine. And this is despite the fact that they are cost-effective, time-effective, and, and often, I think, strikingly therapeutically effective. And the problem is not here lack of research. Of all the areas of alternative medicine, mind-body medicine is the one that has been most thoroughly researched. And this has been going on over three decades. There is a vast amount of, of research information demonstrating that mind affects body, body affects minds, and that there are effective techniques that come out. I think the problem here, first, is lack of education, that this is not in the medical curriculum. And I think that this reflects the prevailing paradigm in Western science and Western medicine, which is very materialistic and says that the only thing that is real is that which we can touch and see and measure, and that if you observe a change in a physical system like the body, it must have a physical cause. So the idea that a cause and a change in the non-physical realm, like mind, could produce a change in the physical body does not compute in the Western scientific paradigm. And I think that that is the reason that mind-body interactions are not emphasized in the training of physicians, why researchers are discouraged from going into the field. And I think really this all traces back to the legacy of Descartes. Uh, there are many um, commentators who say that if Western civilization made one wrong turn, it was Descartes, who pointed us down a road that said that the spheres of mind and body are separate and do not interact. That has been a crippling, I think, philosophical belief that totally pervades our scientific thinking at the moment and has terrible practical consequences in medicine. When I debated uh, Arnold Relman in uh, March, one of the things he said that to me was very revealing was that he thought that, he said that many of the ideas that I proposed were preposterous on the face of this. And one of them was the idea that breathing could affect the body. He said, clearly it goes the other way around, that diseases can cause changes in breathing, but the idea that breathing could produce changes in health or disease to him was absurd. It's absurd because he is stuck in that Cartesian paradigm which makes it impossible to see how the non-physical realm could affect the physical realm. You know, he also gets very upset when I use the phrase, in my experience, because he says that we can't refer to our experience, we only have to look at results of randomized controlled double-blind trials. But let me just give you an example from my experience. Uh, this breathing technique that Victoria taught you is an ancient yogic breathing exercise that I recommend a lot. It's in all my books and newsletters. I teach this to many patients. 
this causes a striking change, an immediate change, in the relative balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. You know, in most of us, the sympathetic nervous system is overactive. That's the branch of the involuntary nervous system that prepares the body for emergencies, for fight or flight responses, and so forth. One of the effects of sympathetic stimulation is to speed up the heart rate and increase blood pressure, because in an emergency, the one thing that you must have is constant blood flow to the brain. So those kinds of functions become crucial. One of our fellows who's about to graduate, Dr. Karen Koffler, was visiting a friend and relative in Chicago recently, a man who works on the Chicago Commodities Exchange, which you can imagine is a relatively stressful job. And he had had episodes about one or two a year of a cardiac arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation, which is common and serious, in which the upper chambers of the heart beat rapidly and irregularly. If this doesn't stop, uh, it's a fairly serious problem, and strong drugs are used to correct the problem. And he had had to go to emergency rooms repeatedly to have drug treatment to stop these episodes. While she was with him, he had an episode of atrial fibrillation. And she told him there was a breathing technique that she would teach him that she thought could control it. So she taught him to do this procedure. And as he did it, after a few minutes, the atrial fibrillation stopped. And this is a result of recruiting the parasympathetic nervous system. It's causing stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which naturally slows the heart, you know, reduces the electrical responsiveness of the heart, and so forth. And by the way, he also has not had an episode of this since he did that. But if he does again, he now knows there's something he can do on his own first. If that doesn't work, you know, he can always go in and get the typical pharmacological treatment. But there, from the world of experience, you know, is a perfect example of how powerful this kind of intervention can be. Now, the reason, okay, I'm happy to do, we need results of controlled studies to show this to people like Dr. Hellman, but the reason that we don't have the studies right now is that doctors aren't interested to do this. You know, the idea of doing a, a simple study to look at how this breathing affects heart rate, most people in the research community would see this as being trivial, fringy, weird. It's not what they're interested in, and that's because they come from an educational system which is locked into the Cartesian paradigm of mind-body separateness and doesn't see the reality of this kind of interaction. I also think there's a curious situation we have at the moment that there has been a tremendous expectation created in the public by the popularity of books and television programs about mind-body medicine, that this is the direction that science and medicine are moving in. And that is absolutely not the case. Mainstream science is relentlessly pursuing a, I think, quite illusory goal of trying to explain all disease processes in terms of physical mechanisms and to eliminate the mind even from those few conditions in which there is agreement in the medical community that the mind plays some role. When I was a, a medical student in the late 1960s, there were four diseases that everybody agreed were psychosomatic, meaning that the mind was involved. Didn't mean that the mind caused it, but that the mind was involved. These were peptic ulcer, bronchial asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and ulcerative colitis. Now, that's not a lot of diseases, four out of you know, all that's there, but at least in those diseases, everybody agreed the mind had some role. And look what's happened since I've been out of medical school. Peptic ulcer is now taught as an infectious illness caused by a bacterial infection in the stomach. So therefore, medical students are taught that you no longer even have to ask about patient stress and factors that may affect digestive function. You know, all you do is give antibiotics. Ulcerative colitis is no longer taught as being a stress-related disorder. People are busily working to find the physical mechanisms in rheumatoid arthritis and in asthma, and the psychological component of these diseases is no longer stressed. So even so, that little list of four is being whittled down, hopefully to zero, uh, and then you know it'll all be a matter of physical mechanisms and physical interventions. And I think that that clearly is is a very destructive effect of the Cartesian paradigm in science and medicine. So this is something that has to change. It has to change as a result, I think, first of a philosophical shift, as Tracy explained. The philosophical shift will allow more doctors to do the research that's needed and to convince other people that these are practical methods that can be used. And personally, as a practitioner, and I think this is something all of our fellows see in our clinic as well, these methods, based on mind-body interactions, 
are fun for both patient and physician. You know, it brings an element of interest and joy back into the practice of medicine. They are often strikingly effective at dealing with an enormous range of clinical conditions. You know, because really, anywhere you've got nerves in the body, which is everywhere, potentially you've got mind and the possibility of producing changes, these methods are very cost-effective and time-effective, and they do not carry the risk of toxicity that pharmaceutical interventions have. So there's tremendous amount to be gained by establishing mind-body medicine as a central component of the new kind of medicine that we're trying to create. Our next speaker is Dr. Bill Benda. He's going to be talking to you all about nutrition. He received his medical degree from the University of Miami School of Medicine at Jackson Memorial Hospital and then did a residency in emergency medicine at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. He then remained there after his residency as Director of Emergency Medical Services. In 1984, he served as the sole physician in Eastern Rwanda, which certainly opened his eyes to new ways of doing things. And following that experience, went to Big Sur, where he directed a small family practice medical clinic and headed up the emergency medical department there before coming to us. And Bill, is, as you saw with the meditation, has kind of earned a reputation within our program of guiding many meditations and bringing flowers and plants into the program and did not bring with him three children, but did have to leave behind in California his dog. I know, isn't that so sad? But now, interestingly enough, has taken a huge interest in equine therapy and the use of horses and the therapeutic relations there, my personal theory is he's transferring that need for his dog to bigger and better things. So help me welcome Dr. Bill Benda. Thank you, Tracy. I have 30 minutes to tell you all about nutrition. I really can't do that. I cannot tell you all you need to know. It's impossible. So what I wish to do is give you some food for thought. I wish to somehow portray to you why nutrition is critically important, not only in our patients' health care, but in our own personal health care as well. Why do we focus on nutrition? If there is one thing that we do voluntarily from the day we are born until the day we are die, it is probably to put food into our mouth of some kind. And this is an area where we have enormous choice. We may not think so at times in our busy lives, but we do have total choice over what we eat. In 1997, the American Dietetic Association did a nutrition trend survey, and they came up with two basic misconceptions that the public has about food. One is that there are good foods and bad foods. Now, you may imagine going to the local fast food restaurant and getting some deep fried zucchini dipped in ranch dressing. That's not what I mean by good and bad foods. That's not a healthy choice. But if you consider where the zucchini came from and what it was like in its fresh state, or where the unadulterated, unprocessed oil came from inside of the, uh, the corn kernel surrounded by a husk, if you consider where the bread came from, some whole wheat grown somewhere in the country, the actual components of any food is neither good nor bad. It's basically what we do to it that makes it healthy or not healthy. And this is where choice is extraordinarily important. The other misconception is that it's important to eliminate all fat in the diet. You know, we are faced with increasing obesity in this country. We all have our own personal images we want to take care of. The fact is, if we do not consume fat, we cannot live. Fat makes up the cell membrane of every cell in our body. The brain is about 60% fat by composition. We need fat in the diet. But again, it's crucial to determine what fats we put into our body, because those fats will be incorporated into every cell. There are obstacles, of course, in today's modern world to good nutrition. One is taste. We like what we eat now because it tastes good. Another is satisfaction. Many people feel they are satisfied with their diet, despite their health. They don't associate their nutritional status with their health. A third is time. This is a big factor. It's very difficult to go to the store, pick out the right vegetable, come home, put it in the fridge, take it out, cut it up, steam it, serve it nicely, clean the dishes. It's much easier to stop by a restaurant and grab a meal. The fourth, and perhaps one of the most crucial today, is confusion. We've come down to a soundbite world. So if a study comes out, a small study that shows something that's very interesting, it pops out in the news. And it tends to be taken as fact by the public. 
Another one is that small studies, such as pilot studies or case control studies, are much more exciting to hear about than these lengthy meta-analyses or review articles, which kind of, those are the ones that cover the topic in depth. And a third reason is that news traditionally, as we know, unfortunately, tends to be negative. So we hear a lot more negativity on the radio or on television than we hear positive aspects of nutrition. And this tends to undermine public confidence in nutrition. So what we get from the media is very difficult to sort out in our heads as to what is good and what is bad. And don't think that is any more easy for physicians or nutritionists or scientific researchers. Nutrition is a very controversial area right now in scientific literature. There's also the aspect of business. Food associations defend products that are really considered less than healthy. Those of you who are old enough may remember that a while back, since before the food pyramid, there were the four basic food groups. Well, those four basic food groups had a lot of input from the American Dairy Council and the American Beef Association. There is a lot of commercial and economic force behind what information is given to the public. Vested interests are not only commercial. In today's academic world, really what's important to a lot of academic centers is grant money. And I can't blame them. It's a tough world economically. But grant money comes from doing research. And if you're doing research, you may find yourself between a rock and a hard place on what you study and what you publish. And if you're put on NPR radio to talk about your latest little pilot study on nutrition, you tend to want to build up what your study was about because you want that grant money because you want to survive in the academic center. So it's tough in this world, not only for all of you and your own businesses, but academically as well, to find a real pure idealistic approach to any kind of topic, especially in nutrition. Where does the public get their information? The most trusted sources are basically going to be health associations, physicians, dietitians, on down the list. The least trusted information comes from the internet, TV, radio, newspapers. What's interesting, though, is that if you look at what's available to you as information, it's just the opposite. You have total access to TV, to radio, to the internet, but if you want to see your healthcare practitioner, it usually requires an appointment, a lengthy wait, and then paying a substantial amount of money for advice. So what's available is not what's the most trusted. Why is diet crucial? Chronic disease is now our leading health problem. Back in the early 1990s, the average life expectancy was 47 years of age, and people died from infections for the most part. Influenza, pneumonia, gastrointestinal infections. In the 1990s, the life expectancy is 75 years, and the leading causes of death are heart disease and cancer and other chronic diseases. These are chronic conditions. Why are there so many chronic conditions? something called oxidative stress. Why is nutrition important? Nutrients, good nutrition, minimizes oxidative stress, which will decrease the incidence of chronic disease. What is oxidative stress? It has a negative connotation because of the word stress, but the fact is that oxidation takes place every moment in every cell in our body. It's part of the natural process of life. If you have a bacterial infection, let's say you have a small abscess in your skin, your body sends neutrophils and macrophages to the site, and they perform oxidative functions to chew up the bacteria and to make you healthy. Normal biochemical reactions require oxidative reactions, but what the body does after that, after the job is done, the body makes neutralizing antioxidant reactions to take care of what happened in the first place. It's a nice balance. The problem is, in today's modern world, oxidative stress has risen dramatically. Air pollution, pesticides and hormones in foods, some of the medications that we take in a normal course to improve our health, cigarette smoke, the list goes on and on. Oxidative stress is going up at an amazing rate. On the other hand, the body's normal antioxidant response is in trouble because it requires certain nutrients to allow it to have this neutralizing effect. And with today's population explosion, Foods have to be placed on the shelves for long periods of time, which requires processing to make them last a long time, which requires taking out all the things that go bad in foods, which basically includes many, many of the nutrients, many vitamins and many minerals. Here are three areas of illness that are very big in today's world, cancer, cardiac disease, and autoimmune. What does oxidative uh, stress have to do with these three areas of illness? Well, for cancer, cancer is basically rapidly growing tissue. And it's been studied, and it's been shown that every cell in our body takes about 104 oxidative hits a day, which means there are 104 chances a day for every cell in our body that something may be altered by oxidative stress. 
It's thought that in cancer, what's inactivated initially is the cell's ability to make its own antioxidants. And therefore, that opens the cell up for more damage. It's like the old Star Trek series when, you know, the phaser comes in and knocks out the shields. All of a sudden, the Enterprise is sitting there in open space, vulnerable to attack. That's what's thought to happen in cancer. Some of these oxidative hits stop the antioxidant normal system of the cell, and therefore it's open to any oxidative hit that comes along. Cardiac disease is another one. The low-density lipoproteins have a tremendous amount of antioxidant activity going on inside of them, and if that's neutralized, then it can stick to the arterial walls and cause plaque and cause thrombus and cause cardiac disease. Autoimmune is another. Imagine your normal tissue. It's recognized as normal by your body. If it receives a lot of damage from oxidative stress, then your body's normal immune system starts to look at it as a little funny and then a little different and then maybe foreign. And then your body's normal immune system may decide this foreign material has to go. And then you have autoimmune disease. You have your body attacking itself. We're going to switch now to the one area of nutrition where you can make some wise choices that will make a tremendous difference in the quality of your health. And that's in the area of fats. And fat as a word doesn't have the greatest connotation. I must say I'm not crazy about the word myself. We kind of tend to take it personally as a body image thing. But fats are critical to life, and it's critical to choose carefully which fats we partake of in our daily life. What are fats and oils? Well, basically, fats are solid at room temperature, and they tend to come mostly from animal products. Oils are liquid at room temperature, and they tend mostly to come from plant products, although some fats do come from plant products as well. And we've heard about good fats and bad fats. Well, saturated fats are found mostly in animal products, and they're a chain that have all the receptor sites for hydrogen atoms completely filled, and they tend to increase cholesterol. Now, we have heard throughout the last couple of decades that cholesterol is bad. Cholesterol isn't really bad. Cholesterol is a normal molecule that we make ourselves in our body. But it's a type of cholesterol that we take in that can make the difference between health and illness. Monounsaturated fats, such as olive oil, canola oil, found in pistachios, avocados, is a very healthy kind of fat to take in. And these tend to lower the LDL cholesterols in our body. Polyunsaturated fats, which have come around in the last uh, 20 years or so, have a lot of empty hydrogen spots on the, on the molecule. These also tend to lower cholesterol, too. Although there's a problem here because they are susceptible to something that is known as transformation. And what happens is when you have many hydrogens missing from the lineup in the molecule, they can tend to change configuration. And this happens especially with heating of the oils. And heating of the oils is what they do when they process the oils. And if you have these changes of conformation, these fat molecules are still incorporated into your cellular membranes, but they alter, the, again, the fluidity of the cellular membranes, and the cells don't work normally, and it's a setup for chronic conditions and chronic diseases. We've heard of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Essential fatty acids basically mean that your body cannot produce them from other materials. Your body can produce almost any fat there is from other materials except the essential fatty acids, and here we're talking about the omega-3s and the omega-6s. Okay, what's the problem with that? The problem is that, especially for omega-3s, this is one fatty acid that goes rancid quickly. This is one fatty acid that is susceptible to oxidation in the environment. In nature, they're contained inside of a plant seed, fully protected from the air and from sunlight. But when we break open and process that food and bring that oil and that fat out, it tends to go rancid and our food does not last on the shelf. Therefore, food processing tends to remove that before it hits the supermarket. And so the food will last a long time in the supermarket and on your shelf. But we lose the omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids, these are both good. But you'll notice they have different effects. Omega-3 fatty acids do things like decrease platelet aggregation. This is very important for keeping the blood vessels clear, keeping the blood rather thin, as we might say. It also suppresses inflammation. This is important in such things as rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune diseases, kind of calm down the inflammatory effect. Omega-6s have the opposite effect. They increase platelet aggregation, which is good when you cut yourself shaving because then you clot off and you don't bleed. They also stimulate inflammation, which is very good with infectious processes because you want inflammation to happen to take care of the infectious process. What's important here is to balance these two out. The omega-3s are found in such things as flax, flax oil, cold water fishes, such as salmon and herring. And the omega-6s are found in your corn oil, sapphire oil, sesame oil. And what's happened in the past couple of decades is we have tend to use a lot more products that have omega-6s 
and a lot less products that have omega-3s, and the balance gets upset. The historic balance is thought to be anywhere from 1 to 1 to 1 to 4, with omega-6s greater than omega-3s. Nowadays, it's thought it's about 20 to 1 omega-6s to omega-3s. What can we do about this practically? We can switch over from using the omega-6 fatty acid materials, such as corn oil and safflower oil, to the omega-3s, such as canola and olive oil. So, as long as we're talking about recommendations, what can we do to keep ourselves healthy by watching what we eat? Well, I went through all of the American Dietetic Association guidelines I could find, and I picked out the factors that seem to be common to all of them. And they seem self-evident, but let's just cover them briefly because they are extraordinarily important. The first one's really important. Eat a nutritionally adequate variety of foods. Okay, well, it sounds pretty obvious we're supposed to do that, but let's look at the words. First of all, nutritionally adequate means whole food. It does not mean processed food. It means whole food. The whole foods contain the vitamin E, the vitamin C. The whole foods contain the various other nutrients, the omega-3 fatty acids, all of these things in the natural form that our cells need for health. Variety is important, too, because some foods contain some of the good nutrients on one hand, and some contain good nutrients on the other hand. We need to have a variety of foods in our diet. Eat less fat, especially saturated fat. Now, I know there are a lot of fat diets out there, or a lot of new diets out there. It's very confusing. Should we eat more protein, less protein, more fat, less fat? In general, I would say less fat, especially saturated fat, and try and focus on the monounsaturated fatty acids such as the olives, olive oil, canola oil. Balance calories and activity to achieve and maintain healthy weight. We're talking exercise here. Now, exercise is not only important because it takes off weight and we look thinner and we're healthier. Our bodies throughout history, throughout eons of history, were created with exercise and physical activity as a normal and natural part of being healthy. It's good that it takes off weight and we have less body fat, but our entire cellular system, our psyche, our emotional aspect, as Victoria mentioned in Mind-Body Medicine, exercise is extraordinarily important for our overall well-being. So when you consider your physical activity and your exercise, don't just think of it because of what your body may feel like or look like. It's an important part of the entire health picture. Eat more complex carbohydrates and add fiber to improve glycemic index. So a lot of big words here. What does this mean? I wish I had an hour because I would have added the concept of glycemic index into this talk. All that means is that it's a rating system given to foods, mostly to carbohydrates, on how fast they're absorbed from the intestine into the blood system. Simple carbohydrates like white bread and sugar and other such foods are absorbed very quickly and your blood levels go up very rapidly and your pancreas takes a look at this and says, oops, blood sugar, got to get rid of it somehow, and it makes insulin and the insulin allows the sugar to go into each and every cell of your body. Well, your cells can only take in so much sugar, so your body says, I have extra sugar. What am I going to do? I'm going to make fat out of it, and I'll store it for later. Complex carbohydrates aren't broken down nearly as fast in the intestinal system, and they are absorbed more slowly. Therefore, your blood sugar levels go up gradually, and they sort of plateau out at a lower level. And this gives the pancreas time to look at the situation and put out the appropriate amount of insulin. And there are two important effects of this. One is that we don't put on the extra weight. You know, we can say, I want to eat more of the sugars and less of the fats because fats make me put on weight. Well, those sugars that you eat, those refined sugars, are made into adipose tissue, but your body can't use them immediately. The other one is, if your body sees high levels of insulin over and over and over again over the years, then your body tends to get resistant. Just like if someone bugs you over and over and over again in your daily life, you tend to tune them out. And when your body gets insulin resistant, this is another name for type 2 diabetes, and this is very likely a cause of chronic type 2 <coughs> diabetes. So what do we do? What about supplements? What about our diet? We talked about oxidative stress and how there's so much oxidative stress in the world today and how processing of foods has taken the normal natural antioxidants out of the grocery store. Well, we need to add antioxidants to our diet. It's easy to take it as supplementation. It's really the best idea is to take it as whole foods. Whole foods are just rich in antioxidants. Bioflavonoids, phytosteroids, tannins, terpenoids, indoles, all these big fancy chemistry words. They're, it's incorporated in our natural diet. Keep in mind that we did not evolve as humans simply as a species bouncing along the evolutionary trail on our own. We evolved in conjunction with animals, 
with the plant life on this earth, with the water, with the soil. We all evolve together in a synergistic way. The foods evolved along with us to give us exactly what we need for health. It's the best source of nutrition is whole food, organically grown, keep out the pesticides and hormones, whole food, unprocessed. It's not always possible. And therefore, we consider supplementation with such things as mixed carotenes, which is a precursor of vitamin A, vitamin C and E, which are very important antioxidants, selenium, coenzyme Q, and there are quite a few others. What about the fats and oils we've been talking about? We should really try and minimize the polyunsaturated oils because they tend to be transformed into these trans fatty acids, which are really strongly linked with heart disease and chronic other diseases such as autoimmune diseases. Instead, it's good to use unrefined monounsaturated oils, especially when cooking, when you add heat. What does unrefined mean? Well, oils can be cold pressed, which is the best way to get your oil. And when it says cold, it doesn't mean cold. It means less than 140 degrees Fahrenheit. It's still pretty warm. However, in other ways of extraction of oils, they use heats up to 350, 400 degrees, which alters the chemical nature of the oil. And another way to extract oils is with the chemical hexane. So the best thing to do is look for your cold pressed olive oil or canola oil, especially olive oil, and to use these especially when cooking. The good oils will not last long on your shelf. The good oils will have the vitamin E and they'll have the omega-3 fatty acids in them and they'll want to go rancid. So keep them in a dark place, preferably keep them in your refrigerator. And when you cook, try and use the lowest heat possible that will still cook the food. If the oil starts to smoke, you're probably transforming this oil into a trans fatty acid form. A recent study that Dr. Weil brought to our attention is where they took men and they were examining the brachial artery in vivo, and the people were alive, and they fed these men three different diets. They either had a, a McDonald's type diet with 66.4 grams of fat in the meal that was fried in oil that had been used over and over. They fed another group of men the exact same meal, 66.4 grams of fat, in food that had been fried in brand new oil, and then they fed a group of men a low-fat diet, I think it was 18.7 grams of fat, and then they compared the inside wall of the brachial artery only four hours later. Those that had the low-fat diet didn't show any changes. Those that had the high-fat diet cooked in brand new oil didn't show any changes. But those that had the high-fat meal cooked in the oil that was used over and over showed changes in the wall of the inside of the artery that would not allow it to dilate within four hours. And as we know, heart disease is a problem where the coronary arteries do not dilate or they're, they're clogged by plaque to the point where blood can't get through. This is another reason to avoid fast food and fried food because they don't change your oil after every meal. They really can't do it. Another one is to consider the addition of vitamin E, about 300 international units per pint of your oil. This will act as a natural antioxidant, so if the oil starts to oxidize, the vitamin E can help neutralize that. Let's shift gears for just the last couple of minutes. In your mind's eye, here is a beautiful bunch of grapes. And in your mind's eye, reach out there with your hand, pick the grape of your choice, and pop it into your mouth right now. Bite into it, nice and crunchy. It's sweet, it's good, swallow it down. Okay, that was great. Now, think about how these grapes were created. Think about what the land was like over millions of years until it got to the point where someone said, I want to grow grapes. And all the animals and all the insects and all the bacteria in the land. Think about how someone took the time to clear the land, take out some of the trees, unfortunately, remove the rocks, till the land, make it soft, put in all the thousands of little stakes that are required to grow grapes, have someone string all the thousands of miles of wire to grow grapes, find the best grape cuttings, plant them, nurture them, watch them grow, water them, keep the pests off of them. The sunshine comes down, the grapes take in the sun energy, the chlorophyll, and the grapes grow to maturity, and then someone, a group of people with families just like yours, go out there and they find the grapes and they pick them, and if the grapes are not quite ready, they don't pick it. Put a lot of intention into picking the right grapes. The grapes go and get washed and they get packaged and sent to the supermarket and they're stacked up in the supermarket. And then you or one of your loved ones goes to the supermarket to buy food. And when you or your loved one goes to pick out grapes for the family, they don't just throw it in the basket. I bet that 
you would go and you'd kind of look over the grapes and kind of look underneath some of them and pick out the very finest grapes that you can find for your family or for yourself. And this is an act of love. All of this energy from thousands of years ago until the minute that grape appears on your kitchen table is incorporated in some way in this bunch of grapes. So now, reach out there with your mind's eye, pick a favorite grape, feel the texture, pop it into your mouth, and slowly bite down on it. There's more to food than just putting it in our mouth and eating it. There's a lot of intention and energy incorporated into every morsel that we eat. And this is what one of the senior fellows, dear Karen Koffler, taught me, called social nutrition. Consider the amount of energy and intention that goes into each morsel from planting to growth to harvest, and then utilize each bite as a meditation on thankfulness and health. Because if we can actually incorporate this attitude on a daily basis in what we eat, it may not show up in the next week or the next month, but I tell you for certain that it will show up in every part of your life over the course of the next few years. So thank you and bon appetit. The argument about fats and how much fat is desirable to eat is, I think, a very intense debate in our culture today. We've been subjected to a great deal of propaganda about the benefits of low-fat diets. And as a profusion of non-fat and low-fat foods has appeared on the American market, Americans have gotten steadily fatter. One reason for that, I think, is that many people regard these foods as being low or free of calories. That is not true, that often these low-fat foods are extremely high in high glycemic index carbohydrates, which may contribute to obesity even more than high-fat foods. There are also some very striking exceptions, if you look around the world, at the general notion that high-fat diets are unhealthy. Uh, by the way, I should just uh, back up here for a second and say that while we have overwhelming evidence that the percentage of saturated fat in the diet is a major determinant of health, that is, the more saturated fat you eat, the shorter your longevity and the higher the chance of premature cardiovascular disease, there is a general assumption that we have comparable data for total fat in the diet. You know, there's an assumption that the higher the amount of total fat you eat, the shorter longevity, the worse general health. That is absolutely not true. We have no such data. There is no scientific evidence that total fat correlates with general health. So the evidence is very clear for saturated fat. And I think that it's very wise to tell people to try to keep their saturated fat intake as low as possible. The easiest way to do that is to cut way down on intake of animal foods, especially meat, unskinned poultry, and whole milk dairy products. One of the exceptions is Mediterranean diets, and uh, in particular, the traditional diet of Crete, where people are eating 40% of their calories as fat. And the island of Crete has one of the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease and cancer in the world, and certainly in Europe, and is at the opposite extreme. Do you know which country in Europe has the highest incidence of heart attacks and saturated fat intake? Scotland. Scotland has probably the worst diet, it's one of the worst diets in the world, very extremely high incidence of saturated fat and the expected correlation with heart disease. The latest contribution of Scots to world cuisine is deep fried Mars bars, uh, <laughs> really, which are uh, dipped in batter and fried in the same oil as the fish and chips. You get these at fish and chip shops for dessert. On the other hand, Cretans, spelled with an A, uh, are eating 40% of their calories as fat, but the fat is mostly olive oil. And, you know, this looks like an extremely healthy diet. The two healthiest diets that I've been able to identify in the world uh, appear to be the traditional Japanese diet and the Mediterranean diet. And they're very different from each other. Japan has the highest longevity in the world, despite an enormous level of stress, a, an extreme level of industrial pollution, high rates of cigarette smoking. They live longer than anyone else. And the Japanese diet appears to be highly protective. But I think there's some principles of it that are very interesting that we should pay attention to, especially having to do with the aesthetics of food presentation and the whole spiritual aspect of food. A tremendous acknowledgement of seasonality. There is an enormous uh, Japanese 
emphasis and cuisine on paying attention to the seasons and presenting food that correlates with the energy of the season. Uh, another very interesting aspect of the Japanese diet is its inclusion of great numbers of wild foods. You know, people go off in large numbers in Japan and pick wild things in the mountains and countryside, and these are eaten in the diet, and they have many elements that are beneficial. But the Japanese diet also includes a lot of strange foods that have flavors and textures that are not particularly liked by Westerners. By the way, the Japanese diet, traditional diet, is about 10% fat by calories, which is about as low as you can get. The Mediterranean diet is relatively low in meat, which is eaten very occasionally. It is high in fish and in vegetables. It includes some dairy products, especially in the form of yogurt and fresh cheeses, whole grain breads, significant amount of fat in terms of olive oil. It's a diet that I think most Westerners like that can be very adaptable and is much more palatable to us because of its uh, fat content. And yet that diet also appears to be correlated with an extremely low incidence of cardiovascular disease and cancer. So I think there's a great deal to be paid attention to there. In terms of the unhealthy and healthy fats, uh, one point I'd like to clarify is that another category of unhealthy fats are polyunsaturated vegetable oils. This is corn oil, safflower, sunflower, sesame. Uh, these oils are chemically unstable and oxidize very quickly and promote inflammation, cancer, degenerative changes in the body. It's important to talk about this because a previous generation of physicians and nutritionists told us to eat these oils as the counterbalance to saturated fat, which we saw as being unhealthy for the heart. Polyunsaturated vegetable oils contain a predominance of fatty acids called omega-6 fatty acids. The number has to do with where the position is in the fatty acid chain of the double or triple bond. Some people think that one of the most significant and dramatic changes in human nutrition that's occurred recently has been an enormous change in the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids in the diet, principally as a result of introduction of extracted polyunsaturated vegetable oils, which were not eaten in great quantity by previous generations of human beings, and is pretty much a 20th century phenomenon. In Paleolithic times, the game that people ate, the animals that hunters got, were animals that were grazing on wild grasses and as a result of that, their tissues contained a high proportion of omega-3 fatty acids, which are not found in today's animals, and they're only found in fish. It's estimated that in the Paleolithic diet, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids might have been on the order of 2 to 1 or 3 to 1. Uh, in the 20th century Western diet, it's now about 40 to 1. Uh, this is an enormous change. And we recommend to most of our patients that come to the clinic that they really identify and try to work on consuming sources of omega-3 fatty acids and reducing intake of omega-6s. So those are some of my comments, and uh, I just want to emphasize that in our clinic, I think all patients are given advice about dietary change. And we work with people who are well and want preventive lifestyle counseling and help them design diets that are helpful, but we also use specific dietary changes as therapeutic interventions. For example, if we work with patients with inflammatory conditions such as autoimmune diseases, arthritis, then one of our suggestions would be to remove from the diet the polyunsaturated oils, artificially hydrogenated oils, and to greatly increase consumption of uh, sources of omega-3 fatty acids. This concludes part two of Dr. Andrew Wiles' Integrative Medicine. Our program continues with part three.
Dr. Andrew Wiles, Integrative Medicine, Part 3. So the next person that's going to be speaking to you is Dr. Bob Lutz. Dr. Lutz received his medical degree from Temple University in Philadelphia, and upon completion of a surgical internship at the Naval Hospital in Oakland, he served with the U.S. Navy Reserve and was assigned to the Marine Corps. After that, he finished a family practice residency at Bayfront Medical Center in St. Petersburg. And again, each of these individuals have a lot of awards and honors I could tell you about, but I'll hit some of the highlights. After receiving the Teaching Resident Award, Dr. Lutz pioneered the Sports Medicine Fellowship, so he has a uh, history of pioneering efforts, especially in fellowships, and we're very fortunate to have him here. The part of our program that emphasizes that we seek to model health and wellness, Bob is a triathlete and puts us all to shame by running every day at lunch while we're all eating. <laughs> so he's been wonderful in leading our team in that direction. I think the first week you were here, wasn't it like the first week you guys started, and we were... Well, we were at clinic, which is a little bit removed from our program house, and I was in a hurry, and I'm like, i got to get to my car, i got to get back there, and Bob says, don't you want to walk? <laughs> and I asked the nurse person, I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't, and then never, never have you asked me that again, but I actually appreciate your reminding us of the necessity of incorporating physical activity in our life, and I will ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Lutz. <laughs> I have the opportunity and the pleasure of talking to you on botanical medicine today. And this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. It also, I think, very much is reflective of many of the things that Dr. Weil and others have talked about today, and that oftentimes we believe that when life is out of balance and illness may occur, oftentimes just gentle means all that's really necessary at rebalancing. And certainly botanical medicine is such a mean. What I'd like to really focus on are three major objectives. Basically, the importance of knowing what to buy and some ideas around that question. Next, the importance of knowing who is doing the shopping and specifically, therefore, who are you shopping for. And finally, the conversation, the communication that needs to exist between you as consumer patients and or you as physician providers. But before I go there, I want to give you a little bit of a historical overview. I think this sort of contextualizes where botanical medicine is right now. Now, we are all familiar with the fact that botanicals have been used throughout history for various aspects of healing. Indeed, old evidence suggests their use in ancient cultures such as Egypt and China. And very much so, botanical medicine was an integral component of Western medical practices as physicians were taught botany in medical school. However, in the early 1800s, a very significant shift occurred in the way botanicals were looked upon. Specifically, in 1803, a German scientist isolated morphine from the opium poppy, and therefore a quote-unquote active substance was identified. And this brought about a real frame shift in how botanicals were viewed. Now, previously, botanicals were provided in crude form, and with the understanding that botanicals exist as a combination of inert as well as quote-unquote active substances, one could expect a gentler response, a sort of larger therapeutic window to work within. Now, certainly identifying an active component has the distinct advantage of being able to more accurately dose. It also, unfortunately, has the converse effect of toxicity, which is something, as Dr. Weil alluded to before, that this is a major problem in today's pharmaceutical market. Now, certainly over the last years, we've seen a really renewed interest in alternative and complementary practices, as Dr. Gaudet mentioned earlier, and certainly we have studies that support why these practices are very much of interest to people. And botanical medicine certainly is one that's at the forefront. If one were to look at Eisenberg's comparison studies of 1990 and 1995 data, for example, we see that botanical medicine has grown some 380% in that five-year span. It's been estimated that people will spend up to $3 billion per year on botanicals, most of which is out of pocket. What's also of note, though, in looking at Eisenberg's study is that people still, unfortunately, continue to use products without telling their practitioners, estimated 70% plus. 
So this is of great significance and great import, as you can imagine. Now, the federal government in 1994 packed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Now, this landmark piece of legislation attempted to provide a little greater information to consumers and certainly make botanicals more available. And I'd suggest to you that it's done that, but it also may have increased some confusion. Specifically, botanicals are classified as supplements, and therefore they do not come under strict FDA regulation. So any problems which arise need to be determined after the effect, I should say after the problem. Secondly, botanicals are required to be classified or make reference to what are called function and structure claims, or as nutritional assistance. And under that rubric, okay, they again cannot make distinct record of being used for specific medical problems. So for example, kava kava will be recommended for mental well-being, or sal palmetto will be used for prostatic health rather than its specific function. And I think probably of most import is that there are no real requirements forwarded by the government right now in specifying quality control issues. And again, as studies have suggested, what you buy and what's on a label is not always what's inside the package. So again, with these thoughts in mind, I want to give you some ideas about my first objective, specifically knowing what to buy. And I think, you know, as you have heard, we've mentioned before, and as I will certainly make great emphasis upon today, the importance of education, the importance of self-education, now, historically, we've been able to rely upon our providers, our physicians, for this information. But certainly in the realm of botanicals, you can't really go to physicians and ask them. Oftentimes, you as consumer patients are more knowledgeable because you've been able to look at the literature. Physicians are not taught these skills in medical school. And so again, that sort of produces a somewhat of a compromise. So I think it's real important for you to be very well educated. Now, I'd like to spend a little time on knowing what's in a label. I think we were very much introduced to this with the idea of food, the nutritional labels. I think that if one knows what to look for in a label, one can then again make good purchases. And the first thing I'd like to point out is this idea of standardization. And again, this is somewhat controversial because not all botanicals can be standardized. But I'd suggest to you that right now, for many botanicals, this is probably your best guarantee. What it implies is that a biologically active substance or one that is used as a marker for biological activity has been identified and quantified. And therefore, what's provided here actually meets those kinds of qualifications. So for example, milk thistle is a common botanical that's used for liver problems as a liver tonic. And specifically, it's standardized for a concentration of silymarin, which has been determined to be the active ingredient. I think it's important to know what plant part is being presented. The reason being is that the active components are found differentially in different parts of the plant. And I would point out that you need to be able to get a hold of the company in case of problems. So one should have manufacturing information to include addresses, maybe a phone number. I also would encourage you to look for a lot number or a batch number, okay, so that if problems occur, you can directly reference the particular product and it should also have an expiration date. The final point I'd like to make about label reading is the idea about dosing. One should look for a dose that's fairly easy to be adherent with. If one's looking at taking a supplement three or four times a day, it might be somewhat challenging. If, on the other hand, you're taking it once or twice a day, maybe a little bit easier. The next part I just want to bring out is double safety seal. You know, I think safety concerns are a real issue nowadays, unfortunately, and therefore one should make sure that the packaging you know, has been bubble wrapped, it's sealed appropriately. Also with the understanding that botanicals are very rapidly biodegraded, one should make sure that the packages that they're provided in are opaque or tinted glass. One should look for, again, something to make sure that it's not exposed to air or to moisture. Now this leads me to the idea of what form should I take? Again, a commonly asked question. Botanicals come in a lot of different formulations. And generally speaking, one could find them in both solids and liquids. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. Solids have the distinct advantage of more accurate dosing and maybe palatability. 
with the exception of crude herbs, which we tend not to recommend because of what I just mentioned about their ability to be rapidly biodegraded. Liquids, conversely, have obviously the advantage of being easily taken, okay, so swallowed a lot easier. So for people who may have swallowing problems, unfortunately for many of them, palatability is a concern, and so this may be an issue. The other thing I wanted to point out is the idea of an extract. Extracts are a great formulation to look for. It's a very concentrated form. Okay, it implies it's a one-to-one -one dilution of crude herb with the solvent, the solvent being either alcohol, water, or a hydroalcoholic solution. Tincture, by definition, implies that it's diluted in alcohol. Okay, so it's a higher concentration. It's a less concentrated formulation of the botanical. The fact that it has a higher concentration of alcohol may be a concern for people. So one can get around this somewhat by actually placing the tincture into a hot or warm beverage, which will then evaporate off the alcohol, leaving behind the product. What I'd like to next talk about is the importance of knowing who is doing the shopping and therefore who you're shopping for. The demographic studies have shown that the typical purchaser of botanicals is a young to middle-aged woman who's buying not only for herself but also for family members. And therefore, it's real important to know who exactly you are doing the shopping for. And therefore, there are a lot of considerations which need to be factored in to this equation. For example, with children, okay, children are not little adults. And therefore, the dosing recommendations cannot be necessarily equated or just sort of shrunk down based on adult doses. Also, with the concerns that we've mentioned before, that there's not a whole lot of clinical evidence realize that dosing oftentimes for children is empiric. Therefore, I would encourage you, if you're going to be using botanicals for children, and certainly there are many that are safe, I would encourage you to look for preparations that specifically say that, specifically allude to that, and then we'll make reference to dosing based upon weight, dosing based upon age. At the opposite extreme are the elderly. Certainly metabolism is different, medical concerns, coexistent medical problems, and medications are also things to be factored in. I would encourage safety and caution when using botanicals around pregnancy and breastfeeding issues. Right now, as I mentioned earlier, very little clinical evidence, even more of concern may be around this issue. I would encourage, therefore, safety and caution when using botanicals around pregnancy and breastfeeding issues. Certainly, there are or indications maybe, but again, I err on the side of being conservative because so many botanicals have uterotonic types of effects. Therefore, for women who are pregnant who really want to use botanicals, I really encourage them to work very, very closely with a knowledgeable practitioner in botanical medicine. And around the whole ideas of contraindications and side effects and allergies, again, I think a lot of emphasis is placed upon this appropriately, maybe inappropriately. So many of the contraindications are what I would call relative contraindications. Oftentimes when problems have been identified, they oftentimes occur because people have used the product for too long a period of time indefinitely, or again, if a little's good, a lot's better. Finally, just some ideas around what to ask and what to know, the conversation. As I've mentioned before, certainly being able to communicate with one's physician provider is imperative. Having that freedom, having that comfort is really important. And certainly this is no different when it comes to botanicals. One should be able to comfortably ask their physician, their provider, what is his or her experience with botanicals? How comfortable do they feel with using botanicals? What is the physician's belief? Do they think it's worthwhile to look into? Conversely, are they very skeptical? And if they are skeptical, how comfortable are they if you continue to use those botanicals? Conversely, if I put on my hat as a practitioner, what should I know to be able to provide good information, to be able to partner with my patients? I think I need to be familiar with botanicals, especially those that are most commonly used, those that I may want to use in common medical problems that I'm going to see as a family practice doc. I should have access to references, be they internet references, be they textbooks, so that I can answer questions, so that I can leave the patients with good information so that they feel comfortable with our conversation. So for example, if someone comes to me for anxiety, I should be familiar with Kava. And for someone with mild to moderate depression, using St. John's wort, and a gentleman who may have problems with his prostate, knowing about the benefits of Saul Palmetto. 
So in short, what I hope to provide to you today, again, was a little bit of an idea about how important botanicals are and specifically some issues around the history, knowing about what to buy, knowing about who is doing the purchasing, and finally the conversation. So I think it's a really exciting time in medicine that these types of practices, which are age old, are really being looked at greater and really come to appreciate the healing power of nature. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. There um, are many reasons why physicians are shy of recommending botanicals to patients. First of all, they didn't learn anything about it in medical school. Secondly, there is a widespread prejudice that herbal medicine is old-fashioned and unscientific, something we got away from in the last century by learning how to refine plants to take out pure ingredients and to synthesize them. And that really is the legacy of another aspect of the Western scientific paradigm, reductionism, which says that the part is equal to the whole. And that when you find a plant in nature that has an interesting biological effect, it is better, more scientific, to identify the one component in the plant that seems to be of most interest, to purify that, and possibly to tinker with the molecule to make the effect even stronger and more dramatic. My lecture to second year medical students, I give them a talk on herbal medicine, and one of the points that I always try to make is that there is no difference between a drug and a poison except dose. Whenever you find something with therapeutic effect, if you attempt to concentrate the therapeutic effect, you inevitably also concentrate toxicity because there's no difference between those two things. If you push the dose of any drug up high enough, you will poison people. If you get the dose of some poisons down low enough, you can find interesting new therapeutic agents. The same thing. One of the great advantages of botanicals is that they're dilute. That is the percentage of active material present there is very low, often on the order of 1% by dry weight, compared to a pharmaceutical that's 100% pure. So the differences there are that when you give a botanical, you're getting a much muted effect. It's often slower in onset, longer in duration, compared to giving a pure chemical in which you get a very rapid, dramatic effect with a short duration. But that also takes you up into the range of toxicity and is one reason why we have 100,000 deaths a year, for example, in hospitals directly caused by pharmaceutical drugs. So there's a great advantage in learning to dilute preparations. And that runs up against the reductionist paradigm. But an even more difficult point of difference to try to explain to conventionally minded physicians and pharmacologists is that another advantage of these botanicals is that they're very complex mixtures of chemicals. You know, that these plants never have one or two active ingredients in them. They have dozens or hundreds of different compounds. And often these are like a spectrum of related molecules, you know, like a color palette. And you've got one dominant thing, and then there's all these shades that are slight molecular variations of the original compound. Now, it is very, in my experience, very, very difficult to try to talk with pharmacologists and doctors about the fact that giving a patient a complex array of molecules is different and possibly better than giving them pure compounds. I am convinced, based on my long years of studies of botanical medicine, that the properties of many of these plants are not due to one ingredient, but due to the complex interaction of this whole mixture of stuff. And furthermore, that if you present the body with an array of related molecules, you may get a better response because you're giving the body choice as to how to respond to what you're giving it. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. One of the great mysteries in botanical medicine from the point of view of conventional science is that some of these plants, this is especially true for some in Chinese medicine, have what seem to be paradoxical effects or ambivalent effects in the Western sense. For instance, there are Chinese herbs that raise low blood pressure and lower high blood pressure. That makes no sense in Western pharmacology. You know, we think of drugs as having single actions. And how could a drug have opposite effects? You know, that makes no sense. 
Um, there is another example that a plant that I studied for a lot of years was coca leaf in South America, the source of cocaine. The leaf is quite different from isolated cocaine, and it's the major folk medicine in Andean Indian cultures. Coca is, is often used to treat gastrointestinal disturbances, and it is said to treat both diarrhea and constipation. That makes no sense in Western terms. Cocaine is a stimulant, and it increases the movement of the gut, so you could see how it could treat constipation, but how could that possibly work for diarrhea? But if you look at the, you know, the molecule of cocaine is very odd. Even though it's a stimulant, the molecular shape relates it to other drugs that have very different effects. It's related to drugs like atropine and scopolamine that are found in deadly nightshade, which paralyze the gut. I mean, that's what the shape of the molecule looks like, but in action, it's a stimulant. So there's kind of built-in paradox to that molecule. In coca leaf, there's about 14 other drugs very similar. And my guess is when you give that whole array to the patient, you're giving the body a kind of mixed message, and it can choose which action it wants to respond to. And that's not something you see when you give single compounds to patients. At any rate, I'm gratified to see that after probably two decades of trying to argue this point with scientists in this country, finally, in the past year, I have begun to see in the scientific literature some acknowledgment of this principle, that it may be that these complex natural products which have all of these mixture of molecules in them, have in fact qualitatively different effects from isolated pure compounds, and that there might be qualities that you get when you give the plants that you won't ever see if you give a single isolated compound. I've just begun to start to see that. I think this has a lot of implications in terms of regulation of botanicals. For instance, all of the FDA's regulations are geared toward products that are single chemicals or mixtures of one or two or three chemicals. For example, if you want to get a new drug license to sell a new drug, you have to convince the FDA that every component of the drug lacks the ability to mutate cells, to cause fetal abnormalities, to cause cancer. How could you possibly do that for a plant that has hundreds of different constituents? It would be impossible. So if we want to regulate botanicals, there has to be a whole new scheme for doing that. You know, we have to have a whole new uh, body of regulation to deal with complex natural products, which we don't have at the moment. And I think this also has a lot of implications in terms of preparations of plants. You know, if you're just standardizing for one element of a plant, how do you know you're standardizing for the right thing? You know, that in fact has happened with St. John's Wort, that for a number of years, St. John's Wort was being standardized for a compound called hypericin. And all the St. John's Ward in the market said that it had 0.3% you know, hypericin in it. Well, it turns out that hypericin probably is not the active antidepressant component. And now there's another compound that they're using called hyperferin. And so you'll now see St. John's Ward that says it's got standbys for both hypericin and hyperferin. We don't know that hyperferin is the single thing that's in there either. So that creates a lot of problems. You know, like if you're going to prepare a plan, how are you sure that you've preserved the activity that you've gotten what's there. There's a lot of problems here, but I think the enormous consumer interest in herbal medicine, which is finally producing a response in the medical profession in terms of doctors wanting to learn the basics of this, has a great deal of symbolic importance. It is a reconnection of medicine with nature, you know, a connection that has always been there through the centuries that really got broken in modern times. I think that in all of the great healing traditions of the world, there has been recognition that nature is the source of healing energy. And I think it's only in, really, in the 20th century Western world that we have come to view nature as something foreign, as hostile, and uh, has seen the business of medicine as distancing us from that. So I think that this represents a very healthy change, and it's great to see physicians realizing that this is an area that they were not trained in and now seeking sources of information so that they can begin to find out about what their patients are using and what might be the interactions between prescribed medication and herbal medication. Our last kind of content area before we then transition into the third part of the day is actually um, covering Chinese medicine and Dr. Ofer Kasky is going to talk to you about Chinese medicine and I just want to share my own personal experience with this because again I think that always shifts our awareness of things and I have to say that you know kind of coming from a psychology and sociology background I've always had an appreciation for 
the mind-body connection and all of this, and I've always felt it should be integrated into all of our health care and our health interventions. But I never did I really understand how this could be integrated until I went through a Chinese medicine evaluation and treatment. And it was so interesting to me because I really understood at a different level that there was no way that Chinese medicine practitioner could take my history just about my physical body. I mean, it was impossible based on her training and the way she approached health and wellness in the system. She had to, by definition, understand the stressors in my life and my mental well-being, and it was all part of the whole. And to see and experience a system where that cannot be extracted, even if you wanted to, is a very, very different perspective of our very own. So you're going to be hearing about Chinese medicine from Dr. Cassie, and let me give you the lowdown on Dr. Cassie. Oprah is our first international fellow who not only uprooted his family and his two children, and how old was Tom when you moved here? Like a couple of weeks old? But brought them all the way from Israel to spend two years with us, and we're honored to have him. Oprah received his medical degree in 1991 from the Hebrew University Hadassah Medical School in Jerusalem and received many awards there, a lot focused on research projects, and he was chosen as a student fellow for Harvard Medical School. And then he spent a year in China, which I think puts him in a very unique perspective to talk to us today about Chinese medicine. Then finished a residency program in internal medicine and headed over this direction to take a leadership role in integrative medicine, which he'll take back to Israel when he heads back that direction, hopefully not too soon. One of the team members wrote this wonderful little description of Ofer, which is just so great that I have to read it verbatim every time I introduce him, because <laughs> it captures the essence of who he is. A critical mind with boyish charm underneath intellectual intensity. So with that, I introduce Ofer Cassie. Hi. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. I'll try to walk with you through these subjects and to talk about Chinese medicine within the context of the culture and the philosophy. So it's not just medicine. We will cover some of the theory and I'll try to show you and to come together with you to the conclusion that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Then together we'll try to understand disease and the concept of disharmony. We will proceed talking about the art of medicine, and we'll finish up looking at the present and the future of traditional Chinese medicine, PCM stands for that. It's impossible to talk about Chinese medicine without talking about the context. Allow yourself to imagine that such a system that is thousands of years old came up from living in nature. At that time, in the absence of technology for good and ill, at that time, human beings lived in nature as such, observations that were made in nature during the daily life were immediately translated to other realms. Some of them are very philosophical. So the issue of philosophy of medicine and human nature is very important to understand. And my colleagues talk about nature, about the healing potential of nature, manifested in many different ways. It's important to know that Nowadays, you cannot take the Chinese medicine, the details of Chinese medicine, taken out of their context. And for that reason, the main point to remember is it's not about taking pieces that work. For example, acupuncture for low back pain. It's not about the modalities. It's about the whole system as an approach to health and well-being. Western medicine gives us a lot about anatomy in many different ways. So the metaphor for that in the Western world is like the body is a machine. However, when you look at different level of anatomy, and it doesn't matter really what resolution you're trying to look at, you get only one level of understanding, which is important. That's the way you can classify tumors, either as benign or malignant. It is important. And yet in clinical practice, often we face patients that anatomy-wise Everything is okay. You cannot find what's wrong with them. And yet, they subjectively complain of many things. What Chinese medicine brings into picture and the enrichment of Chinese medicine is about function as a metaphor, the human body as a garden. 
And as I'll show you at the end of the talk today, what we are trying to do in integrative medicine is to take both and to combine them together. So now you get a different, a better level of resolution. What are you dealing with as a physician? Some describe and define health as the absence of disease. That is like describing peace as the absence of war. And we all know that that is incorrect. And it captures only a very limited, narrow definition of the subject. In Chinese medicine, in particular, the concept of well-being, harmony, and balance is very important. Yin and yang are probably the most familiar concept of Chinese medicine. And they are used in many different connotations. Victoria Macy's show you today the yin yang metaphor of the mind-body medicine and the body-mind medicine. However, if please bear in mind that you can apply it not only to medicine, but to nature and philosophy in general, you can learn that this interrelationship between yin and yang are really what creates harmony and balance and well-being. And this symbol that became to be the symbol of Eastern Asia is a symbol of wholeness. And that is something that in integrative medicine, in distinction from allopathic medicine, and I'm trained as an internist, that is something that we try very much to pay attention to and to strive to. Qi is another important concept in Chinese medicine, and it is well known to everybody. Now, when one tries to translate Qi and to say what is the equivalent in Chinese, in English, or Hebrew, or whatever language you speak, then there is no one good word that can translate and captures all the richness that the concept of qi conveys. So for that, definitions like vital energy are really narrow than what qi is about. It's about life, but not only about being alive, but about qualities of life, about things that we all do as human beings on a daily basis. And by defining the qi quality of each and every organ, and as the chi quality of the human being, you can learn a lot about quality of life and about purpose of life of the human being. Thousands of years ago, matter and energy were regarded as the same. And you cannot escape talking about Chinese medicine even a bit without mentioning the fact that the human body, as well as animals, as well as many other living creatures in the world, all of us are made of, so to speak, of elements, and yet these elements cannot live by their own. These elements interact one with each other. Living in nature and making the observation in nature so many years ago, human beings and the philosophers at that time looked at nature and thought that you can divide nature into five elements or the five phase theory. That is not to say that they were reductionists. That is to say that looking at nature, they were looking for rules, rules and laws that can describe what are the relationship between different components of nature. They came up with five, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. These five elements maintain between them a very complex relationship. They support one each other. They create one each other. So for example, Wood creates fire, the fire, the ash after the wood is burned, creates earth, the earth from the earth, we can take metal, and so on and so forth. Yet, talking about balance and harmony, if everything can augment everything, then you can come up with something that is never in control. And for that reason, they restrict one each other. And if it reminds you about yin and yang just from a minute ago, that's because nothing can be separated from the other concepts. So they are all interrelated one to each other. Immediately, this concept of the five elements was translated into medicine. And it was only a question of time until they pertained organs of the human body to these elements. Allow yourself to imagine that this enriched system gives you a huge opportunity to intervene medical-wise. And the main reason for that is that if one presents, for example, with a problem in the heart or in the fire element, there are three ways to approach that. 
One is to do it directly and to treat the heart or the fire element. But two other ways is to approach it indirectly through the blow of the mother and son. In that case of the heart, the mother of the heart is the liver or the mother of fire is wood or the son of the heart, the skin and the earth. So you can approach it indirectly. And that is not enough. Because as you can see, as a whole system, when something goes wrong with one element, then it influences immediately the all element. And that's part of the challenges of diagnosis. So you actually, while intervening in one element, you influence the whole system. That is beyond just anatomy, you can believe. At that time, thousands of years ago, autopsies were not allowed to be done in China. And for that reason, the notion of anatomy, the knowledge about anatomy, was gathered and created and collected in a different way. They came up with a morphological classification of the human body, so to speak, two categories. They thought in, in ancient China that the human body is composed of organs that are polyhematotic and they create things, and organs that are hollow, that has lumen, that has a lumen inside them, that really not create things, but rather absorb them or contain them. Another way to look at the anatomy of the human body is through the meridians, and we all know about acupuncture and meridians. However, if a physician or another healthcare practitioner takes a 200-hour course in acupuncture, in my viewpoint, that is nothing more than a technician to know how to needle and where to needle. But that doesn't make this practitioner to become a Chinese practitioner for the good reasons I'll show you in a second. And even if you look to be a technician and to needle and to make your life from that, even then you are asked to look at the rooting and then the spirit of what the anatomy represents. The Nei Jing is the ancient book, the classical book of the internal medicine of the Yellow Emperor. And actually what's happening in this book that was written approximately 2,500 years ago, if not before that, is that the Yellow Emperor took the privilege of having a personal physician named Chi Po. And the Yellow Emperor and Chi Po exchange ideas. So the Yellow Emperor would ask Chi Po questions and Chi Po would answer them. All of these texts appears in the Neijing. The English translation is available and appears in your references. Chi Po was asked by the Yellow Emperor about how disease happens. So you have the anatomy. And you look at the function between the five elements, but really, how this is happens? And Chipo, without hesitating, said, it's about not only the offending factors, it's mainly about the host factors. Hmm, that's new. Well, in medicine, in internal medicine, and in many other disciplines of medicine, Dr. Wild just talked with you about hepatic ulcer disease and the role of Helicobacter pylori. In medicine, we never or seldom address the host factors unless it's in the extreme, like the immunodeficiency viruses. In Chinese medicine, it's part of the values. As a matter of fact, you can maintain, and it's a value to tonify your health system and to maintain, to prevent disease to happen. So Chi Po, in this saying to the Yellow Emperor, talked about the evil, but talked about the human being, the host factor. So how does this happen? And what might be the offending factors? Some of the offending factors or disease causes are well known. The external excesses are relating to the weather condition, extreme weather condition. Emotional excesses relate to our internal mind-body relationship, so to speak. And for that reason, it shouldn't come as a surprise that so many diseases are associated with abnormal emotion, both in their quality and their quantity. Dietary irregularities that Dr. Bimbenda tried to talk with you today about really can prevent disease from happening. And parasites, you know, the idea that parasites and bugs are new to medicine only from the really creation and the microscope is not true because living in nature and drinking contaminated water with worms, they could see the worms later on in other situations. 
So the idea of parasites as causation for disease was well known to the Chinese practitioners thousands of years ago. The only way to collect data in the absence of the permission to perform surgeries is by the taking something from the surface of the body and making an assumption that you can learn from the surface of the body about the interior of the body. An example for that would be taking pulses that is so well known in Chinese medicine. However, today, in this day of experiential and integrative medicine, I wanted to show you about Kang because that's another realm. The Chinese medicine philosopher came up with a way to classify or to describe tongues according to their vitality, color, shape, coating, and moisture. So you can really create now a matrix where you can look at your patient tongue and say, aha, if the vitality is such and such and the moisture is such and such and the coating is yellow rather than white, then it signifies something for the interior. So where does all bring us? It brings us to the art of medicine, really the art of practicing medicine. Because in Chinese medicine, the important question is not what X caused Y, but rather the context, the relationship between X and Y. And for that reason, no matter with what disease, symptom, disorder, or syndrome you are dealing with, as a practitioner, the real important thing to accomplish is to treat the disease from the root, not only symptomatic relief, to try to dispel evil and to support right and to restore in and young balance. And that is done through different modalities. Acupuncture is probably the most well-known one. Max Brushen is another way to enhance acupuncture effect, and that is by burning a herb cocktail in a form of cigar or any other form above acupuncture. Also, the herbal medicine, and Dr. Bablas talked with you about herbal medicine, and this is another way. Qigong is working on the energetic level of the human being, and tuna therapy is the Chinese equivalent for massage. But it's not important what kind of modality you choose. It is important for the practice, but for the needs of this talk, please remind yourself the take-home message is that you want to restore balance, well-being, and harmony. In November of 1997, the NIH holds a conference trying to come up with a consensus statement about acupuncture. And that is not because practitioners like me need the stamp or the sign or the approval or the signature of an authority like the NIH. It's because it's important for forwarding and promoting the research and the practice in these areas. And the NIH announced that acupuncture is a legitimate treatment, based on that, you can all file a claim to your insurance company, to your HMOs, asking them to provide you with acupuncture, because that is now a legitimate, as effective as, and at times more effective than conventional allopathic treatment. This wouldn't happen unless research. We in the program in integrative medicine are committed to research, committed to data and to evidence. And I can assure you that if you will join us to future events that we will host, we will bring you more and more of that, not saying this is important more than other experiential work or body of evidence that was accumulated throughout centuries and thousands of years of practice. But talking about research and the future of that, it creates two unique challenges. One of them is the issue of individualization. You can imagine that each and every one of us is a unique human being. So really, putting on yourself a label of migraine or hypertension doesn't allow research in Chinese medicine, because you can have migraine or hypertension because of many different reasons. So you need to individualize the patients who are part of that research. And another important issue is the question of blindness. How can you come up with good modalities that, for example, would be what is the gold standard for sham acupuncture, and so on and so forth. So where does all this bring us? We started today by talking about Chinese medicine within not merely a medicine, but also a philosophy. Then we proceeded by talking about health and well-being. I provided to you some of the parts within the context of the whole, the yin-yang, the qi, the meridian. Then we talked about the art of medicine, 
And the question that must come to mind is how can you integrate? If these as a metaphor are two languages, how can you integrate and speak both languages? And the way we do it in the program is through taking into consideration many, many different factors. And as you can imagine, from one individual to another, the importance, the relative importance of each and every of these factors is different. Among these factors are the patient preferences. We highly value in integrative medicine the patient as our partner for this therapeutic journey toward healing and well-being. How much it is supported by evidence or by the literature, practical issues, like if there is a practitioner in the area where the patient lives, what are the financial issues that are associated with that? The practitioner experience and other components of the treatment plan, because it's never just one component. As my colleagues, Victoria and Bill and Bob showed you today, and as I'm trying to show you, it's not about pieces of the puzzle, but rather the old puzzle. So now you can see why for me, Chinese medicine, once again, is a very allopathic position, and my friends can tell you how much conventional I am. I have no ponytail, no earrings, nothing that will identify me with the field of complementary medicine. For me, the real value of Chinese medicine is by adding the structure and the function and living in the unknown, living in the uncertainty, willing to collaborate with other physicians and healthcare providers in my community to provide the best service for the patient, saying, I don't know, let's collaborate, let's work together. Chipo, the Chinese equivalent of Hippocrates, speaks about three levels of physicians. The most fundamental one, or the basic one, is the one that treats the body, the physical body. That's who I am, who I was a year ago. I think that the supreme level, the highest level, the one that we are all striving to be, is the level where we help people to fulfill their destiny. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Caspi. When I was a medical student, acupuncture was regarded in the same way that sticking pins into wax dolls for voodoo purposes was thought of. There has been an astonishing change in our perceptions of that, and it happened almost instantaneously when Nixon made his first visit to China. He was accompanied by James Reston, the senior correspondent for the New York Times, who had an emergency appendectomy in Beijing and reported on the front page of the New York Times that acupuncture relieved his post-operative pain. And that single statement led many patients in America to seek acupuncture treatment. And when doctors saw that patients were willing to pay actual money for this treatment, suddenly they became interested in it. And it's a remarkable to see the extent to which Chinese medicine has penetrated this country since then. And also rather strange, because this system is based on conceptions that are as different as could be from the Western paradigm. And we've let this foot in the door of acupuncture. It's mostly used here for pain relief, which is not its principal use in Chinese medicine. In Chinese medicine, it's used to move energy around the body. But nonetheless, the foot got in the door. And what that foot is attached to is something very large that does not fit with the Western model. Two aspects of Chinese medicine that strike me, well, three aspects that strike me as very, very important. The first is the emphasis on energy. And uh, right there, you're up against the materialistic paradigm. You know, as soon as you're talking about moving energies around the body, you lose Western scientists. The second is the emphasis on prevention. Now, there's a very clear statement in Chinese medical philosophy that disease begins as an energetic disturbance. That is, it is imbalance in the, on the energy level, either too much energy, too little energy in specific organs. And if that energy disturbance is not corrected, eventually it will crystallize into a change in the structure of the body. So that what we call early disease in Western medicine may in fact be middle or late stages of disease, that we don't see the early stages. And Chinese physicians feel that by their methods of diagnosis, including tongue diagnosis, especially pulse diagnosis, they can pick up these early stages of disease, which are much easier to correct. And the other aspect of Chinese medicine that I am particularly interested in is this emphasis on function of the body rather than the form. That in the West, you know, we look for measurable 
changes in the structure of the body or function as we can measure it objectively. And Chinese are perfectly comfortable looking at the body functionally. And as uh, Dr. Caspi said, some of this may have historical and cultural roots because since autopsy was not done in traditional Chinese culture, Chinese scientists didn't focus on the internal structure of the human body and instead they developed a system of identifying functions of the human body and their relationships to each other. And let me just give you a very concrete example of how this different way of thinking can have very practical advantages. The Chinese did not know about the immune system. You know, they had no sense of what tonsils were or what the appendix was, but they had a very clear concept, and this probably goes back hundreds if not thousands of years, that one of the most important functions of the body was defense. So they identified the fact that the body had a defensive sphere of function, and they explored nature to find ways of enhancing that function. And the Chinese pharmacopoeia includes many herbs that are considered especially valuable in Chinese medicine because they're believed to enhance the defensive function of the human body. In the West, we focused on structure, on the organs, and all these organs that are now known to be part of the immune system, we didn't know what they did. So we said they were functionless. And this is right up into well into my lifetime. You know, when I was growing up, it was impossible to make it to adolescence with your tonsils and adenoids because these had been labeled functionless organs, you know, useless structures that were just taking up space in the body and could give trouble. So at the first sign of trouble, you took them out. There are countless people in the past, in this country, you know, throughout most of the century who went into hospitals for abdominal surgery, for hysterectomies or gallbladder removals, who didn't find out until they got their hospital bills that they had also had their appendix taken out because this was also considered a useless structure that could give trouble at some point. The master gland of the immune system is the thymus behind the breastbone. Uh, this is where white blood cells, lymphocytes, go to be programmed early in life as to how to recognize antigens throughout your life. So this is one of the master components of the immune system. It's very active in childhood and adolescence when it's doing all this work, and then it shrinks at the end of adolescence. Western doctors did not know what this organ did. And the fact that it shrank in adolescence was taken as proof that it was a useless structure. I don't follow that logic, but that's what was done. In the 1950s, doctors at leading academic medical centers invented a disease that every child in America had called thymic hypertrophy, meaning the thymus is too large, which was treatable by shooting x-rays at it, which caused the thymus to shrink immediately. Large numbers of parents of educated well-to-do families in this country were persuaded throughout the 1950s to bring their children to academic medical centers to have courses of x-ray treatment to destroy the thymus. We don't yet know what the long-range immune consequences of that are. We do know that many of these children 30 years later develop thyroid cancer because when you give radiation anywhere in the vicinity of the thyroid, that's one of the consequences. I think that really says it all in a way about, first of all, when I hear conventional allopathic doctors talking about the harmfulness of other systems of medicine. I mean, that's really people in glass houses throwing stones. I mean, I, I don't know of any alternative practitioner who would consider destroying an organ of the body with some kind of technological weapon. And also the chutzpah to say that because you don't understand what an organ does, therefore it is useless and you may as well get rid of it. But I think there's a real contrast there between structural thinking and functional thinking. You know, that Many of these herbs that Chinese medicine identified, when we test them in Western laboratories, actually do increase immune function. They increase the numbers and movement of white blood cells that eat bacteria and natural killer cells that are defensive against cancer. So for centuries ago, as a result of thinking functionally, the Chinese came up with useful methods for enhancing immunity. Whereas in the West, when we were locked into structural thinking and didn't understand the function of these organs, you know, we wound up removing and destroying these organs out of ignorance. So I think that's just an interesting contrast, which points up the advantages of looking at the body functionally, something that Chinese medicine has always done. Thanks. Thanks, Offer. Thanks, Andy. One of the things I wanted to go ahead and comment on is that the day today that we have designed is not meant to be representative of all that we're training the physicians to be aware of. 
a couple of people asked me about different modalities and do we not deal with you know, expressive arts, or do we not deal with manual medicine or different things? We decided to focus today on things that you could implement in your own lives. And so it's not a mirror of the fellowship program, just so you're aware of that. Okay, now what I'd like to do is start you all on this journey of creating your own health assessment based on the survey that we did this morning. And in many ways, just like when we're practicing integrative medicine and we're sitting across from a patient, in many ways, the most challenging part is, okay, you have all of these tools and a lot of other ones that we haven't even referenced. How do you even begin to pull that together and create some sort of health assessment or some plan of action that works for the patient? And there's no easy way to do that, except I would tell you that it's a process. It's not something you're going to get in final form. Even when we spend hours with patients and offer to them a personalized treatment plan, it's the beginning point. It's the starting point for a longer process in which you explore things, you try things, and you kind of adjust accordingly. So if, again, you could just reflect on your own story, think about the things that really jumped out for you this morning. And what I'd like you to do is just reflect a moment on those different categories, general health, lifestyle, which includes everything from the food you eat to the activity you have, your habits, whether or not you use supplements, how it is for you to be in the world in terms of just what is your typical day, what are your stresses, what are your sources of joy, relationships in your life, joys and fears, spiritual issues. And what I would ask you to do is just for the purpose of this exercise and this beginning point, to think of the one thing or one of the things that really jumped out for you. It could be anything that we talked about this morning in your personal health assessment. So what was the part of your life that you went, yeah, I could probably focus on this and I could probably work on this a little bit. Okay? Does everybody have something in their mind that they're going to focus on for this exercise? Yeah? Do you have something in your mind that really jumped out at you that you want to kind of process this with? Then just take a few moments and think. I mean, don't even deal with reality for this part. Just think about what would the ideal in that part of your life look like? So if you're dealing with kind of nuts and bolts things like nutrition or exercise or spiritual issues or your general level of stress, just take a moment and think about what would it really look like if that were ideal for me? How would you feel? What would it express as? What would your life be like on a day-to-day -day way that's different from what it is now? And if any thoughts come to mind, just kind of jot that down. And like I said, don't even worry about reality. This is a fun exercise, right? <laughs> then I would ask for you, which probably has already happened, to let some of the challenges around that come into your mind, some of the barriers or the part of you. You know how you have those little parts of yourself? And while one part of you is going, yeah, I could do that. That would be beautiful and wonderful to be in that ideal way. The other part of you going, yeah, right. <laughs> how are you going to have the time? How are you going to have the energy? Whatever those barriers are that have come up for you, think about those for a minute. You know, let's give those the space now to kind of come into your mind and into your consciousness and say, okay, here would be the challenges around that or the barriers that I would see. And you don't have to list everyone, just one or two. Let them come into your mind. Lots of times that's easier than the ideal part of the vision. <laughs> that's human nature for us. And then what I'd really love for you to do is whether it comes from something that you heard today in the areas of nutrition or botanical medicine or mind-body or Chinese medicine or something outside of that that you know of yourself, I'd like for each of you to think about at least one thing, and it can be minor, minor, minor. It doesn't have to be major. If you're feeling really motivated, it can be many steps or a big step. But at least a small thing that you feel like in the next week you would be willing to do to move you ever so closer to that ideal. Okay? And really give some thought to that. I mean, like I said, it could be a simple little thing. It can be discussing this with a partner. Or it can be, you know, I'm going to start running a mile every day beginning tomorrow at 5 a.m. Depends how adventuresome you want to be. But be realistic. Something that you really feel like you can do and you can commit to. Do all of you have a next commitment step that you're willing to say yeah that came to you? 
freight. You know, this was intended to be a little appetizer. You know, this is a long process. It's really a lifelong process. And, and once you understand that your life can really be about a process of healing, and, and again, I would remind you of that quote I shared earlier, that wherever you stumble, it is there that you find your greatest treasures. I love that concept. So not to steer away from those stumblings, but to go into them and, and see what's there for you. And I would like to close this segment with another poem which I think will speak for itself. This poem was written by a woman named Janet Quinn, who's a nurse, if you're not familiar with her, at University of Colorado, and is doing wonderful work in this area. And this poem is entitled, Healing Magic. You say you are a healer, binding up wounds and applying potions and salves for a broken humanity. Tell me, kind healer, have you found on your journey a wound deeper than lovelessness? A person more broken than the one who's the heart they found was long ago change. abandoned. Yep. In search of what okay. we do not know, if not for love no. itself. And tell me, gentle healer, how do you bind the wound of lovelessness? What potions and salves do you carry in your black bag that can mend the broken heart? I'm sorry, you say. I have nothing. There is nothing I can do. And that, dear friend, is where you are wrong. Put down your bag, leave go of the rummaging for magic other than your own. Open your heart, pick up a hand, gaze into an eye, share in one true moment, and watch healing begin. So I love that, and I share that with you from Janet Quinn. And I hope you've enjoyed this portion of the day. We are going to move into questions and answers. So go right ahead. Dr. Weil, what work have you done with mental illness? Well, mental illness is a big category. I would say that you know, the commonest varieties of mental illness, anxiety and depression, I've done a lot of work with. And I think for those, integrative medicine has a lot to offer. For anxiety disorders especially, I think that removing sources of anxiety, teaching people relaxation methods, and especially practice doing breath work can be more effective, in my experience, than the usual drugs that are prescribed for controlling anxiety, which are addictive and interfere with mental function. For mild to moderate depression, I think there are, again, a lot of things, especially regular aerobic exercise, use of treatments like St. John's wort extracts, or other dietary supplements that may be very useful. For major mental illness, for psychosis, I think there is much less there that integrative medicine can do. For schizophrenia, I really don't know of treatments from alternative medicine that are useful. For manic depression, I think there is probably more. And I think especially working with a person in them how to create balance in terms of regular exercise, regular diet, meditation, and so forth, but I would not see that as a replacement for the pharmaceutical drugs. I live in Houston, and please, please advise us how to find a competent specialist in integrative medicine that you would feel comfortable going to. I have interviewed and spoken to several to whom I would not visit, so I would like to know how you can recommend that for us. Well, I think you have to realize at the moment, demand for these services greatly exceeds the supply. You know, since our medical schools are not training people this way. There are several sources that you can check. One, I would say go to my website, and there's a practitioner's referral directory there in which you put in your zip code and then ask for the particular kind of service that you're looking for. You can also go to the specialty organizations, such as the American Holistic Medical Association. It's not that easy, however, to find physicians with this integrative perspective that we're putting out there, although we're busily training people. You know, there's now a lot of people that have taken our CME courses, and I think, you know, the prospects are good for the future. So I'd start there with that suggestion, see what you can find on the website. I suppose it follows with the same answer if someone is fighting cancer and wanting to combine the traditional with the complementary. <laughs> That's medicine. really the hardest of all the areas. 
for a lot of reasons. One, the emotionalism that surrounds cancer. Another, the fact that the defensiveness of oncologists who know that their treatments are not as good as they've been advertised. Also, the outrageousness of people in the alternative cancer treatment field, that all of that has made for a great deal of polarization. And the problem is it leaves patients out in the cold. You know, often the conventional doctors will say, this is all nonsense, or even if you use any of those methods, I won't see you again. And the alternative practitioners say, if you do chemotherapy or radiation, these methods won't work. And we find that the vast majority of cancer patients who see us are just looking, they just want a doctor who can help them make decisions, tell them how to combine various forms of therapy. I think there's a huge demand for that service. We are planning an integrative oncology CME training course. We finally, after some difficulty, have good relations with our cancer center, which is a large regional cancer center in Tucson. We see a lot of cancer patients in our clinic. So I think that's difficult at the moment, but again, coming. You know, I've begun to meet oncologists who realize that this is what patients want. And we've just gotten a new head of our cancer, the Arizona Cancer Center has just been appointed. He starts, I think, in August. And when he came to his interviews, one of the things that he said to our dean was that one of his goals was to work closely with integrative medicine. So that sounds great. I would encourage you, instead of looking for more options in an additive fashion, to look at it as a synergism. And one particular example would be mind-body medicine. I think that no matter what kind of chemotherapy, radiation, or whatever is chosen to be the treatment of choice for cancer, each and every modality in the mind-body arena will enhance that and empower that. And the last thing I would add to anybody is that at this stage before we're to the point where we have people who are really trained thoroughly in this, the single most important thing I think that you should be looking for in the interim is somebody that's open to it and willing to investigate it with you. Because if they are committed to doing that with you, they'll learn along with you. I seem to want to do the things, all the things that are not supposed to be done, like eat sugar a lot, like to smoke cigarettes. I mean, I don't like to, but I continue to do that kind of thing. And I'm wondering, with addiction type issues, what you have to say about this. I think changing behavior is one of the hardest things of all. I mean, it's much easier to add an herb or a vitamin than it is to change addictive behaviors. And, you know, you're probably familiar with the people who say that stopping smoking is sometimes considered harder than stopping heroin. It's a very powerful addiction. Having said that, there are things that we do when we meet with patients in terms of looking at why it is that they're smoking and what their motivation is to stop smoking. And by really understanding, first of all, what's the good that you're getting from those behaviors? Because there are good things, otherwise you wouldn't be staying in that position. And then, you know, what are the advantages perhaps of changing the behavior and doing some weighing? Most people, when they get to the point that they are ready to make a change, are successful in doing it. So most smokers, for example, quit cold turkey. They don't quit because they've gotten a patch or the gum or whatever it is. They quit because they're ready. And so what we help do is we help people become more ready to make the change. And uh, one technique for becoming more ready is to spend time with people who have the behaviors and habits that you want to have and to spend less time with people that have the behaviors that you want to get rid of. I mean, that's just a very practical strategy that you can use. And there are a lot of tools out there that can be helpful you know, when you're ready. Acupuncture has a very good track record in helping people with addiction. Hypnosis is a good tool that can help people with addiction. There's no magic thing that works for everybody except motivation, as Victoria said. This is a general question for we would like to answer. I'd like to hear uh, something about the relationship between curing and healing. The concept of our Western model of medicine is really focused on, as I said, finding the pathology and curing it. I think the best illustration of this, I actually heard Janet Quinn, who wrote that poem, discussed. And she says, you know, one of the best illustrations of curing in our Western biomedical model is organ transplantation. You know, if you think about what that is, you take a diseased organ, you cut it out, and you insert and replace it with a healthy organ. So that's technically a cure. 
Now, in order for that cure to become a healing process, that organ has to be completely integrated into the rest of the body. It has to be accepted by the body at a molecular level, at a cellular level, at an organ system level. And if it doesn't, we know what happens. The patient dies perfectly cured. You know, and you think about that and you go, wow. And there are a lot of examples of that in medicine and health and healing. So I think that, you know, the cure tends to be much more biomedically based. And when we can cure, that's great. It's just that I think part of the reason we're in the healthcare crisis that we're in right now is that most problems that patients experience and present with, there isn't an easy fix it cure for. I think the other place we see this really come to life, if you will, is around death and dying issues. That if we're living in a biomedical model where our goal as physicians is to cure, then the second the patient is to a point that you cannot cure them, typically what a physician will do is to triage that patient to somebody else. You know, my job's done because I can't fix you. There's nothing else I can do, like this poem says. And then the patient gets sent to hospice or they get sent, you know, to the pastor or whatever, and the physician typically backs away. One of the things that shifts when you really understand that if our role is not just to cure when we can, but to be a compassionate healer, and if we see ourselves as physicians and other healthcare providers as compassionate healers, then we start to begin to realize we can offer a lot, even when we can't physically cure someone, we can help them in their healing process. One of the most beautiful illustrations of that I can share is that at the end of the first year of the fellowship, we asked the fellows to think of your two most intriguing cases, and by that we meant patients that you know you would not have gotten the results you did before coming to this educational experience your real success stories. And one of the fellows chose one of his two patients, a patient who was actively dying. Now the fact, the mere fact that he tagged that as one of his greatest successes was his experience of being with that patient and what he learned from her was to me very, very significant. So I hope that answers your question. Also, uh, just as an afterthought, one of, I thought, the most amazing statements that Dr. Relman made in the course of the debate, and this is the man who directed the course of academic medicine for a long time, he said that the purpose of medicine was to cure disease, not to make people feel better. And one more perspective that might help you to understand the difference is in my experience with the physician-patient relationship, curing goes one way, but healing goes both. I will leave you with the words of Hippocrates, who is wonderfully reminding us what we have sometimes forgotten, which is cure sometimes, heal often, and support always. And I would tell you that that's our mission as physicians and patients and as community. And so thank you for sharing that with us today. This concludes Dr. Andrew Weil's Integrative Medicine, recorded in front of a live audience. Music by Mark McCoyne. Thank you for listening.